So we got a message from a neurologist and their question was, how do you differentiate pharmacologic dilation, especially because they already went to the ophthalmologist, pharmacologic dilation, from pathologic dilation of the pupil? And so when you're trying to answer this question right here, pharmacologic dilation, the very first thing you gotta do is make sure there's no evidence for third nerve palsy, because that is the dangerous one, and that is a neurogenic cause for a dilated pupil. In the third nerve palsy, however, you're gonna have ptosis and you're gonna have a motility deficit. So your first job as a neurologist in any dilated pupil is make sure it's not a third. That means you're gonna look at the lid and the motility. If the lid and the motility are involved, then that's not pharmacologic dilation, that's a third nerve palsy. So the first thing is examine them. The second thing you gotta do is make sure that they didn't have any exposure. Of course, in this example, the most common is they went to the eye doctor. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the patient is having a pharmacologic dilation, they don't know that they've been exposed to an agent or it was accidental. And so that's often nurses who are working in the ICU with atropine and atrovent and inhalers that have dilating properties in them, scopolamine patches that people have after surgery to prevent post-op nausea, or they had a scopolamine patch because they're going on a cruise to reduce their chance of motion sickness or they've been exposed to a plant substance, the belladonna alkaloids, which will dilate your pupil. And there's all sorts of plants, and you can look up all the different plants that can cause a dilated pupil. They're all kind of in the same family, the atropine belladonna family. Once you've established that there is or is not a contact source, the way to differentiate pharmacologic dilation from other non-third nerve palsy pathologic pupils is to test the near reaction. So if the near reaction is good, but the light reaction is poor, that's called light near dissociation of the pupils. And pharmacologic dilation won't respond to either light or near because it's dilated. But the neurogenic forms, and if it's just one eye and no third nerve palsy, the most common is adystonic pupil. So a dilated pupil doesn't respond to light, but you do the near and it constricts with vermiform movement, sector palsy, no ptosis, normal motility, that's the one, that's Addie's tonic pupil. You also need ophthalmology to look at their iris and make sure that there's not some damage to the iris from cataract surgery or trauma or uveitis in the past or synechia. So in order to determine whether it's pathologic or not, you have to have pharmacologic dilation history, but if you don't, you can use a drop to determine that the pupil is blocked. And the name of that drop is pilocarpine. So if we put pilocarpine, which is a direct acting parasympathomimetic, if it doesn't constrict, that means the receptors are blocked. Mm -hmm. And so if we give pilocarpine 1% to a pharmacologic dilation, it won't constrict because all the receptors are blocked. So you have this big pupil, you put the pilo in, it doesn't do anything, mm -hmm. that confirms the diagnosis that it is pharmacologically dilated. However, if you're worried that it's adystonic pupil, you should do one-tenth percent pilocarpine first because if the pupil constricts to the one-tenth percent, then that is adystonic pupil because it has light near dissociation. It responds to low-dose pilocarpine because of denervation supersensitivity. So the combination of one-tenth percent pilocarpine and one percent pilocarpine should be able to differentiate pharmacologic from pathologic dilation. Please make sure it's not a third nerve palsy and talk to the patient and see about their exposure risk.